Okay. So the one million words challenge on LiveJournal, their little community there that <coughs> I joined last year and had a lot of fun with. I mean, it really motivated me to get cracking with my writing, whether it was writing fic or writing journal entries or writing role play tags or whatnot. Um, they have a writing meme today called 40 Questions, and it's basically about your writing and how it works and what you do with your writing and whatnot. And I thought I'd give a go at it. So I probably won't get all these done, but this is my first shot at some of them. Okay, question number one. Describe your comfort zone. A typical you fic. <laughs> I have a very broad range of writing things. I mean, some of my stuff is... I, you probably know some of it is, you know, really cute, fluffy stuff and, you know, what uh, Neil Gaiman would call, you know, a cute story about people borrowing milk and cute frog bugs. <laughs> Re referencing a cute bit in one of his Sandman comics where one character goes down to her downstairs neighbor in the apartment house and borrows milk and a cute frog mug for her, you know, milk for her coffee one morning. <laughs> and I, I can, I, I do those. I do... Lost scenes of episodes. I do cut scenes. I do, I do the occasional left, you know, turn left kind of alternate universe story, or you know, just plain alternate, you know, parallel history or whatnot. Um, case in point for that would be never doing that again. Question mark. My uh, off and on going. Uh, uh, Jack slash Dianto fan fiction, obviously in the Torchwood fandom. And, which is, you know, cute, you know, cute domestic fluff, most of it. Um, sometimes I'll do really dark, weird stuff, you know. I've got a few splatter fix that I've done. Uh, and then one in particular was, uh, a lost scene from the, uh, <clears throat> the Kyoto arc of Yami no Matsue. What was really going on in Rocky's lab during the 72 hours that he had Suzuki captive? Uh, but it, it runs, it does. It, my fic does run the gamut between the cute and fluffy and, you know, the, oh, this could be straight up part of the canon to the alternate universe to, ah, Renee, where are you going with this? <laughs> You know, so I, it, my comfort zone really does depend on my mood and really depends on where, where I'm at with the fandom or the series or whatnot. You know, it's whatever the mood, whatever the mood strikes me, whatever my comfort zone is for that particular day, which can sometimes be any, anywhere and everywhere in the fixed spectrum. Question number two. Is there a trope you've yet to try your hand at, but really want to? Hmm. That's not something I've really thought of. Although, I haven't done a whole lot of what you might, what I think is called Rule 63 fic. I mean, I've done a few, you know, gender swap stories. One was, uh, <laughs> one was for the Supernatural fandom in which Dean Winchester makes one too, one too many rude remarks about women. Anger's a witch, and he gets turned into a woman for 24 hours. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> I mean, I kind of I kind of want to do that again, although I kind of want to go in the opposite direction. I kind of want to take a female character and make them male, but I'm a little hesitant to do that because female characters don't necessarily get a whole lot of representation in fandom, which is irritating at best. And I need to work on, I myself need to work on writing more fics with female characters in them predominantly. I, I do, I do irritate with myself sometimes. And it's like, Renee, why can't you write more stories with, with two women in them? <laughs> you know, which would put a few more verbs in my sentences when I say things like, you know, you know, can the female characters in the series get a little more love from the fandom, please? So. I hesitate to, you know, rule 63 
you know, in the reverse of the usual direction because, you know, it might not, it might not bode too well given my track record with writing female characters. So, but something to think about. Is there a trope you wouldn't touch with a ten foot pole? We're on the Death Eater. I refuse flat out to write character assassination fix. It just, you know, I mean, okay. Unless the character has royally shot themselves in the foot to begin with. See also Joffrey Baratheon in Game of Thrones slash Song of Ice and Fire. Now, uh, and, uh, for that matter, I don't know if there's any way that you could run the Death Eater Joffrey because he's already run the Death Eater himself. <laughs> Although I have wanted to write stories where his death is a little more karmic than getting poisoned. It's like, really? I mean, I suppose death by poisoning is is a very it, it, you know, is a very painful way to die, but to me it wasn't slow or excruciating enough. <laughs> I kind of want to do a, I honestly want to do a crossover with Yep, Yami and Wat's way where you know, this uh mysterious maestro from Whatever the West, whatever the Song of Ice and Fire universe equivalent of Japan would be, shows up and you know offers to treat the young king and only you know draws out the the young king's death all the more slowly because of course Meraki is using this as an excuse to drain the kid's energy. <laughs> <laughs> I th I honestly think Joffrey is one of the few characters that most people would look askance if I honestly did do the thing where I throw him at Muraki for him to eat. <laughs> Although our the Muraki in Headspace has said to me, "No, really, don't give me that to eat." He t throw him back. He's too small, and he probably tastes terrible. <laughs> so that fic may not happen. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Question number four. How many fic ideas are you nurturing right now? Care to share one of them? Uh, I have a whole... Uh, I have an ent... I have a... Yeah, it is It is an entry on the journal where I kind of... It's kind of a catch-all for the prompts that I would like to write for Comet Fic or Fic Promptly on Dreamwith or whatever. And it's kind of the, okay, you know, I have a fic challenge and, you know, that's it's challenge week on one of these communities and they need fic written. What have I got here that I can dig up and write out? So I've got prompts for a whole variety of fandoms and whatnot. Some of them are just, you know, author's choice, any, so that could be anything. Um, one idea for original fic, which I might ultimately try and get published in one of the one of the Lovecraft anthologies that I'm looking at. Well, Lovecraft inspired anthologies. Uh, <laughs> this was one of those one of those strange ideas that came to me at two in the morning and it may not be the most <laughs> it may not be the most rational or sane ideas, but it's you know, is any idea in the Lovecraft fan of entirely sane? <laughs> We're all a little mad in here. Um, but it kind of it kind of grew out of Hans Rodionoff's graphic novel that's loosely inspired by the life of Lovecraft, in which, uh, come to find out, he wrote all that weird stuff as a way of holding back the elder gods and whatnot, so that they wouldn't break through into this world. So, I was thinking of that, and I was thinking of the sheer number of either Lovecraft-inspired movies or Lovecraftian references and other things that he's done that you find Jeffrey Combs involved in. It's like, does this guy have some, some clause written into his contract that if there's, you know, a Hollywood Lovecraft-inspired film that he has to be in it some, you know, somewhere or other? Because he's done so darn many of them, you know, they're my reanimator and the the two sequels, but also Necronomicon Book of the Dead, where he played a very fictionalized H.P. Lovecraft, who I rather fell in love with. He's kind of a badass there. 
<laughs> I won't go into detail, but it was one of those where it kind of made sense give, if you take into consideration some things that Lovecraft wrote about in some of his letters. So, so I had kind of the same idea the, of writing about a Jeffrey Combs stand-in kind of actor who finds himself having to make some kind of deal where the Elder Gods get held back as long as he keeps appearing in Lovecraft-inspired movies. <laughs> Uh, Jeffrey Combs carrying the torch that uh, Lovecraft carried in Hans Rodianoff's graphic novel. Good work. Uh, now question number five. Share one of your strengths. Um, share one of my strengths. Hmm. I have been told that I do a very good job capturing the the emotions of a character in a given situation that I'm able to, you know, the, the reader is able to feel what they are feeling, that I have this great, and, I, and I've also been told that I have this, this capability of capturing these little snapshots in the character's experience and it's, you know, making it very vivid and just very, you know, I've been told you feel like you're with there with the character. And that, that was very, that was very touching because that's how I look at it. I kind of have a snapshot memory. I may not remember everything that happens, but I, I'm a, I have this this recall where I'm able to capture kind of capture the moment, you know, freeze framed, and it's just sort of some lines of summing up the whole of the experience. And it may not be a big snapshot. It might be just a little thing, but it does capture whatever it was that happened to me. So I believe, I believe I'm able to transfer that to my writing, which I hope is a good thing. Question number six. Share one of your weaknesses. Being horribly slow, getting things written, getting things completed. You know, I sometimes will have stories that it's like I start writing it, I get distracted, and then I go back to it like months later or something. And there's a few stories that I actually have had to discard because the moment passed. Sorry to say, it does happen. I'm not proud of it. And sometimes I wind up beating myself up for it a little bit. Okay. Seven and eight, share a snippet from your favorite piece of prose. Share a snippet from six and eight, share a snippet from your favorite dialogue scene. I'm gonna hold off on those because I'm gonna dig around just to try and find those stories, which I'll do later on. I'll start them later on. Probably as a bonus, maybe. Okay. Number nine, which fic has been the hardest to write? Uh, there is a fan fiction inspired by uh, the CW's Arrow crossover with Torchwood, and then in which, uh, and this was an idea that I played with in one story, and then I decided to expand on it for a Big Bang fic challenge that centered around Arrow. Malcolm Merlin as Jack Harkness's illegitimate son. And the whole reason why he's why Jack is never doing that again. It was it was one of those stories it, I kind of the way I ran it, it ran parallel it ran parallel to the first season of Arrow. And I had a lot of fun writing it, but Certain details wound up getting royally jossed by season two, and I'm kind of not sure where to go with it. It's one of those stories. It's it's completed, other than it's got a couple holes that needs to be patched. I would love to post it, put it somewhere that people can see it, but I don't know if it's ever happening because you know I most of slaved over it, but I worked really hard on it and. I won't say that I feel like the work has been, the the effort was wasted, but it's in the limbo. I'm not sure what to do with it. It's it's out there. I might release it as a what could have been, you know, kind of like one of those one of those cases when they find a movie that was being done by some director and they never finished it for whatever reason, so it winds up being a bonus disc or something in the box set of their whatever. So I might put it up or at least make that post that it's on. I might make that post live, or I might put it on 
archive of our own for archival purposes, but it's one of those stories that I'm not, I'm kind of not sure what to do with it. You know, I like, I like the story. I'm still proud of what I did with it. It's just, I try not to be too much. I, I try, I, I try, I try not to be too hung up on what's canon and what isn't because come on, you know, it's not, I know it's not canon. It's not supposed to be canon. It's my take on the canon, but I kind of like things to sort of maybe not coexist with the canon as such as it is, but I tr I try not to, I, unless I'm doing a straight up alternate universe, I try not to deviate too terribly from it because sometimes I feel like there's some fan fiction that deviates so much from canon, it's like, you know, you may, I won't say you may as well be writing original fic, but there's, there's some, there's some alternate universes that almost go, in my estimation, too far, but maybe I'm just speaking as somebody who, you know, had a semi-minor in literature in college and get, does get a little hung up on, you know, you know, what, you know, what, what, what fits the canon and what doesn't. That may be a habit that I had to break out of. And that's not a bad thing. Sometimes, sometimes habits do need to be broken out of. Number 10, which hit fic has been the easiest to write? It's the one that was easiest to write. It seems like it was one story that was. I I have this sort of on, another another on again on again off again uh, story, in parts. <laughs> it's a Yamito Batsui series of fix where <laughs> Muraki is harassing Suzuki over a cell phone, <laughs> and you know there's different stories, different props where you know it's different things. You know, one that's completely text based, uh, where Suzuki is replying at emoticons, and they get increasingly more and more grossed out. I mean, come on, he's getting. He's getting bothered by Muraki. He's gonna get squicked. <laughs> um, those things write themselves. <laughs> I mean, it's not meant to. Be, it's not really meant to be satire or a send up of people using cell phones, but <laughs> it's just plain fun because. Come on, it's Muraki being obnoxious over a, over a phone and Suzuki responding in kind. And it's just, it just writes itself because I would say those two characters write themselves, but, you know, it provides a lot of comedy. I've had a lot of fun with it, so it just kind of, it just, it just kind of buzzes along as I work on it. Number 11, is writing your passion or just a fun hobby? Why can't it be both? Um, I wish I was a little more passionate about writing, but then again, work has been a bit busy and off and on, and my health's been a little wonky, and, you know, there's, there's been various distractions, so I haven't been able to have quite as many spoons to devote to writing as I wish I could, but, you know, all in all, I enjoy it. So, you know, it, I, ha I have fun, even, you know, and I, I try and write a certain amount of words, every day. I mean, I don't always accomplish it, but hey, you know, as long as you get something done, that's what matters. Number 12. Is there an episode above all others that inspires you just a little bit more? Episode. Hmm. I have episodes that, of things that are you know, the, the best episode of whatever in the history of whatever. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I, one of the nostalgia stations uh, recently, I think it was MeTV, they had uh, Vince Gilligan, the main writer for Breaking Bad, on there talking about some of the vintage TV shows and epi you know, favorite episodes thereof that inspired him and got him into writing for television and whatnot. So I could conceivably sit down and do a whole programming block of, you know, favorite episodes of whatever, but I think the episode that I would have to pick if I was just to, if I was to pick one, it was the first ever episode of Doctor Who that I watched, which was The Girl in the Fireplace from the revival Doctor Who, which was shown to be obviously by my good friend Mark. Hi, Mark. Um, 
you know, I, I mean, I knew the base, the, the basic bare bones of, you know, Doctor Who, that it's about a time-traveling alien who travels time and space in a police box. And along the way, he meets people and gets into scrapes and sometimes saves the day. I wasn't expecting that. I mean, that episode was just... I mean, I often... I, I have often said, and, you know, talking to other people in, in the, the, the Who fandom, that... You know, to me, if you're going to get somebody into Doctor Who, this is one of the episodes to show them because it really shows you what it's all about. You know, it may not have quite have, the, you know, I won't say doesn't, I won't say it doesn't have a happy ending. I mean, it has, it has a rather sad ending, obviously, because, you know, we see what have, happens to Renette in the end, and it's, you know, oh, you never got to see her again. But... You know, it to me it was it was all about what you know what the universe is about. You know, adventures in time and space. <laughs> and I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed the performances and the you know the the effects and the the creatures. I mean, the creatures were awesome. I mean, it was like you know, clockwork killer robots. <laughs> It's like, you know, not just any killer robots, but clockwork ones. It's like, you know, I couldn't help having, you know, the Tenth Doctor's reaction to it. This is brilliant. This is beautiful. Even if it is trying to kill you. <laughs> so that's probably one of my favorites. Um, another would be from the X-Files, Jose Chung's From Outer Space, which is hilarious, almost hilarious mater about... Alien objections. I mean, it's just one of the daftest things ever in a totally daft TV series. You know? Although, okay, X Files is more paranoid daftness, but <laughs> it's one of the funniest things I'd ever watched. So you know. And it's kind of it's kind of about storytelling because you have three or four different characters trying to describe the same events and how it all gets you know how everyone's perspective winds up, you know, not exactly munging the thing, but just turning, you know, just everyone seeing it differently. So it winds up this really whacked out Rashomon effect. So a point of that one. Um, the Twilight Zone. Uh, Time Enough at Last, which I think is, firstly, I think is the best, especially, especially the twist at the end. It's like, you know, you know, here you got this little guy who's just a little too addicted to reading books. Just a little too much. And, you know, everybody else gets killed in an, in an atomic blast. And, you know, finally he has time enough to last to read all these books. And then it gets worse. I won't reveal the twist at the end. Although my dad and I are just absolutely, ah, best twist ever. You know, and my, although I wasn't exactly saying my mother was horrified by it, but, you know, our combined reactions, that is what makes the Twilight Zone so awesome. Um, what else? Supernatural, the monster movie episode. I that is just fun. I mean, the opening credits that are in the style of a Universal Monsters movie. The fact that I, if I remember correctly, the whole thing was shot in black and white. You know, all the monster, the movie monster references. You know, the ver the very clever and ve to me very inspired shapeshifter. That I think is one of their best episodes yet, or best episodes ever. I haven't watched the last two or three seasons. I think two or three seasons. Um. Yeah. I mean, I've heard that the writing has kind of gone downhill, but... Yeah, that, to me, that's... I'll be the judge of that when I watch it. What else? More episodes. Well, I think I'm gonna leave it at that. Don't wanna, just don't want to believe the question. Okay, and I think on that note, I will leave this here. So this is the first of possibly four episodes based on this list of 40 questions.